Everybody dies, don't they? Everybody so come back. The Hand of M.R. James by Sarah Tolmy. I think it will be seen from what has been said that my subject is one which depends for its actuality upon the accumulation of a great number of small facts. There is, of course, a broad historical background, no less than a whole history of Western Europe since the period of the barbarian invasions. M.R. James, The Wanderings and Homes of Manuscripts, 1919. It wasn't until she put in her application for full professor in the first year of the COVID-19 pandemic that Helena realised that the neatly pencilled notes she had read in grad school accompanying this or that manuscript had been written by M. R. James, the famous ghost story writer. This was 25 years after she'd left Cambridge herself. Nobody had ever discussed the other life of the famous codicologist as an author of weird fiction. Likely, it was embarrassing. Still, she suspected that someone must have at least mentioned it at some time, as she had a cat named Montague. It's a good name for a cat, Montague, and never Monty. Who could possibly have mentioned it? She had been surrounded by medievalists and had certainly had no inkling then that anyone who taught her read 20th century fiction, not even such turn-of-the-century productions as those of M. R. James. The likeliest candidate was the dapper Dickensian fellow who had taught paleography, James's own discipline. It was the kind of everyday fact, drawn from everyday life, that he might have dropped in. He was better adjusted than most, he was even married. It was not impossible to imagine him experimenting with antiquarian Gothic fiction in his off hours. Reading anything approaching to horror, or anything closer to horror than hagiography, seemed beyond most of the other personalities she could recall. The spectral linguist whom she had observed actually wringing his long pale hands at meetings. The spiky heresy expert who resembled nothing more than a praying mantis in a glossy dark wig. The rake who lived in his own private but very compelling 18th century. Horror had been likely to overtake the latter, but retirement had fortunately intervened. On the other hand, while house-sitting for a couple of famous philologists, Helena had been impressed by the collection of mysteries, mostly of a cosy vintage character. Who Whodunits have a standing appeal to a certain kind of medievalist, this being precisely the thing that it is nearly impossible to determine in manuscript culture. James, though a manuscript expert, had never written a whodunit in his life. He was the other kind of medievalist, Helena thought, the pessimist. The manuscripts he had spent his life working on were largely anonymous, their existence and their preservation alike the products of nebulous, impersonal forces. Worthless items were collected, precious ones evidently lost. The pressures of history, of style, of occasional bursts of charisma were to be felt, almost palpated, in the corpora of writings he described and catalogued. They were rarely explicitly revealed. His fiction had a similar character. It was never who done it, but what's done it. What implacable, untraceable entity has gone and scared the living hell out of some hapless, learned person? Why is it that being able to anatomize the cathedral with great exactitude will not save you from the terror that lurks within it? Is it not overwhelmingly likely that being the kind of person who has an eye for a good rude screen has placed you in danger in the first place? Casual readers might not think of James as an ironist. Horror is not often thought of as an ironic genre. But that is exactly what he is to a medievalist's eye. Time after time his nerdy narrators are overtaken by precisely those entropic energies that they contend with professionally. They are haunted by the ghosts of their own erudition. The medievalist in modernity, that is the horror of M. R. James. Montague, the cat, was doing the best of the family under conditions of social isolation. There was greater competition for beds and chairs, uh, but beyond this he was unconcerned. He usually won those competitions anyway. 
Sooner or later, someone would get up to pee or snack and return to find him curled like an apostrophe in whatever warm place he or she had left. Cats prevail. Helena's two teenage children and her husband Phil, also an academic, were variously stressed. They all saw a lot more of each other than they were used to. Everyone did more cooking. Novels, video game campaigns and long back research projects were intermittently undertaken and abandoned. As the late spring came on, volunteer tomatoes, beans and kale sprang up in the garden beds. Both parents looked on this with relief as garden centres were closed. Neither had liked to picture the wasteland of the summer without the vegetable patch. Packaged seeds and even seedlings could be ordered online. But this option was somehow horribly attenuated. How could such vegetables thrive, flattened and deracinated by online commerce? Neither of them were believers in the Internet of Things. They preferred to cultivate such sports and genetic survivors as sprang up naturally. They all knew their family was one of the lucky ones. Nobody worked in service or ran a small business. These had been decimated within weeks of the outbreak. They had no elderly relatives in care. Many of these were dead. Terrible news poured into the household from all media channels. But aside from eczema, from the constant hand-washing and a generalised anxiety, they were surprisingly, uh, blessedly untouched. Helena and Phil made donations to the local food bank and began to prep their online classes for the autumn term. Helena, having always been as blind as a bat, had had expensive eye surgery two years previously. Results had been terrific for about 18 months, waking up as a sighted being able to read the clock radio or go swimming without goggles, but then had begun to pall. Her new implanted lenses, which she had naturally assumed would be immune to cataracts because they were made of plastic, began to develop swimmy, blurry spots. It turned out that the high-tech multifocals for which her natural lenses had been swapped out were still contained within natural integuments. These were developing spots of opacity, uh, mini cataracts. Being a cyborg, it was not what it was cracked up to be. She was seriously out of pocket, and her vision was nearly as bad as it had been before, except now neither glasses nor contacts could help. There was a laser procedure available to address the problem, but clinics were all closed because of the pandemic. It was maddening. A two-minute zap with a laser would restore her sight. Drugstore reading glasses were a pretty inadequate solution. While this certainly counted as a first-world problem, Helena had to repress occasional flashes of dread. It was a serious impairment. She did spend most of her professional life reading. There was a lot of stuff she needed to look at that could not be transposed onto her iPad and blown up enormously. Her eyesight changed from day to day as the spot swam around. Weird floaters intermittently crawled across her vision. The most bizarre effect of all was that from time to time she began to see printed words clear as day inside her closed eyelids. This began to happen after she had spent many hours working with text, magnified as it now had to be, on her backlit screen. Alcohol drastically enhanced this effect. Standing in the kitchen preparing dinner during those awkward hours that the French have sensibly written off to drinking, sans cassette, became surreal. Every blink would be accompanied by a graven black phrase hanging in front of her eyes. Did the Khazars, or a significant portion of the Khazars headed by their king, convert to Judaism or not, while her open eyes looked at carrots or watched her hands open tins of tomato puree? Lying in bed at night after a bottle of wine and a movie, a neat paragraph would hover in the air above her as if projected onto the ceiling, surrounded by a haze of orange-yellow light. She found that she could even make these paragraphs scroll. Her mind's eye could contain about five lines, reminiscent of the ancient Mac with its nine-inch screen on which she had written her PhD thesis. In an effort to combat the floating print problem, she took to writing notes in longhand, not all the time, but regularly enough to give her eyes a break. 
It had been nearly two decades since she had written anything by hand except grocery lists. She was out of practice. Years ago, as an undergraduate, she had been proud of her handwriting. While it was not a perfect cursive like her mother's had been, the kind that had once been taught in school, it at least counted as joined-up writing. She had spent a lot of her money on crappy fountain pens, and her hands had been constantly ink-stained, a blue stocking effect she had secretly admired. Now her efforts looked scraggly and thin. Perhaps it was time to invest in another fountain pen, a grown-up one this time. Maybe a waterman. During this phase she also became addicted to audiobooks. This came as a shock. She despised actors and the way actors read books. Still, by judicious sampling she found a good selection of books that she could stand hearing aloud. These were mostly long English and Russian novels of the 19th century. Naturalistic fiction was a bit of a gap in her education. She preferred British readers who did not speak through their noses. As a break between monumental efforts like Middlemarch or the Brothers Karamazov, she listened to Sherlock Holmes stories and turn-of-the-century popular fiction on YouTube. This was how she had discovered, or rediscovered, the work of M. R. James. It was a relief to find protagonists to whose usual knowledge she could relate, the state of the Book of Common Prayer in 1653 or the aftermarket in topographical mezzotints were a lot more intrinsically interesting to her than the different varieties of cigarette ash or how much bruising could be sustained by a corpse after death. Helena, although she very much enjoyed the atmosphere of bohemian bachelor London that Conan Doyle created, eventually got tired of the simple-minded hubris of Holmes. The problem was a professional one, she decided. Conan Doyle had been a doctor who despised medical practice and had failed in it. Holmes was compensatory, therefore, treating his clients like patients, forensically investigating crime as if it were a disease. The great Sherlock was a Dr. Monquet, a clinician with a terrible bedside manner, who nonetheless affected cures in the criminally afflicted. Crime is simpler than medicine. Holmes was thus able to succeed where Conan Doyle had not. Any Victorian doctor would necessarily have spent his life surrounded by frustration and enigma. The profession at large was steeped in unscientific old habits, error, ignorance and malpractice. All of this disappears at a stroke when Holmes becomes a consulting detective, a specialist in crime, that range of curable illnesses in the social body. In this respect, Holmes's treatment of Moriarty was nothing more than a dilation and curettage. Holmes, as an addict, was a physician unable to cure himself, but that was as far as insoluble problems went in his world. That was why the Holmes stories were comforting. They were good stories to fall asleep to. James's stories, on the other hand, were good stories to stay awake to. Enigmatical. They were excellent companions in insomnia. Shy and misanthropic gentlemen experts, though they were like Holmes, James's various antiquarian protagonists stayed true to the angiogenic conditions in which they spent their professional lives. Their adventures were unresolved, inconclusive, partial, dark. It wasn't that they spent their lives in dank Gothic castles or dimly illuminated libraries, most libraries, you'll find, provide good lighting, but rather that it really is the job of a manuscript scholar to face the unknown, day after day, hour after hour. Helena was desultorily putting together an article on Middle English wonder tales about Central Asia. This was rather at the edges of her expertise, but then it is the point of expertise that it should be clear about its own limits while sniffing and scuffling around enthusiastically on contiguous terrain. This process meant that she had an accumulating set of handwritten notes in a large coilback Hilroy exercise book that she had unearthed in her study. She had been delighted to find this relic of her previous life, and every time she flipped through its pages of intercalating headings, notes and queries, she remembered the words of her grade six geography teacher. I want to see your work in a notebook. 
One that you can't put pages into or take them out of. This had been the best advice of her school career. Single sheets of paper get lost. You will never have the discipline to organise them into binders. More importantly, writing things down in the order in which they come to you and being able to trace what that order was reveals how non-linear thinking is. The process of thinking something through is messy and recursive. It's full of interruptions and tangents and lines and squiggles. It forces you to invent private hieroglyphics so as to impose degrees of order. The fiercely idiotic templates that her children were expected to use to construct essays in school gave her the heebie-jeebies for exactly this reason. Such templates went a long way to explaining why first-year students in her classes were wholly unable to think. Of course, her children simply wrote their essays and then went back and filled in their stupid boxes afterward. They were only stymied when the essays themselves were obviated and just the templates were required, as was increasingly the case. Helena was charmed to find that certain of her own personal tics, little marks and signs that she had not seen for years, instantly began to populate her new handwritten notes. They were perhaps even more noticeable than they might have been because they were almost twice the size they would normally be. She had to write really big to see anything. It was like being a neophyte. Her abstruse notes looked like they had been written by somebody in primary school. One of these private signs that really took her back and made her feel positively nostalgic was an arrow with a jagged lightning bolt shaft. This arrow, appearing regularly on the left margin of the page, meant, at its simplest, I am talking now and marked an interjection. She had evolved it while taking lecture notes when she wanted to distinguish what the professor had said and what she thought about it. It was so useful, she soon began to use it in article and chapter summaries. Its range of meaning moved flexibly from Now, what does that make me think of? to No, to This idiot doesn't know what he's talking about. It was invaluable. Helena watched this jagged arrow recur in her notes about Prester John and Tengrism and Rubruck's travelogue and thought comically that it was her mantic sign. Admitting to having a mantic sign and going so far as to obey it were the only things she'd ever liked about Socrates. It was his one point of simple deference to mystery. In listening to his mantic sign, he had been like any other Greek excepting oracles. In her case, whatever it was that followed the jagged arrow often had an oracular quality. Frequently, they were questions. Such questions could pertain to matters quite far from those apparently in hand, or they were partially recalled quotations or disparate facts from the other domains of knowledge suddenly parachuted in. They were epiphanic. That much she had always known. It had always been part of her process. If she had ever wanted to get to the heart of a research topic or find the thing that a paper was going to be about, all she needed to do was follow the track of the lightning bolt arrows. Thinking about it now, she probably should have put one at the beginning of her full professor application. Zap! Jagged arrow! I am talking now. Here is the mystery that is me. One day, rereading her notes about the vexed question of the Judaism of the Khazars, she noticed one particular jagged arrow and its following remark. She could not remember writing it, though the same could safely be said about all the rest of her summary of the particular article she had been reading. This is why we write summaries down. The line read, The whole thing gave the impression that it was the work of an amateur. Its relation to the cultures of the Asian steppe was not obvious. Nor was it a fair comment on the article in question, which was competent. She must have been in a bitchy mood. Some pages later, amid some notes on Icelandic romances set in medieval Russia, she found, Few people can resist the temptation to try a little amateur research in a department quite outside their own, if only for the satisfaction of showing how successful they would have been had they only taken it up seriously. It was true that her old Norse was marginal. Her husband's was much better. 
Finally, a lightning bolt arrow in her notes on Ahmad ibn Fadlan's account of his travels among the Bulgars said, I expect that with you it's a case of live and learn. If this was her mantic sign, it was a lot more mantic than usual. She couldn't recognise the voice at all. It didn't read like one of her own interjections. Yet the idea that somebody could be gaslighting her via notes for an article on Middle English wonder tales was ludicrous. In her own hand, in a bound notebook, to which sheets, thank you, Mr Edwards of sixth grade geography, could neither be added nor taken away. It wasn't like they had been composed in some hip collaborative forum. Nobody wants to collaborate with anybody online about Middle English. It wasn't a glitch in the Matrix. It was more of a locked room mystery. She suspected her husband. He was locked in the same house with her 24-7 and he could read Middle English. From him, a jibe about her amateurism in Old Norse far traveller tales would be fair comment. But that was ridiculous. Why should he bother? She asked him about it. She showed him the notes. He pointed out that he had seen plenty of weird shit in her notes over the years and went out to water the tomatoes. It's just the voices in your head, he said, kissing her forehead. Don't worry about it. I love those voices. She examined the coil-back binding of the exercise book. It appeared intact. She reviewed the writing. It looked like her own, or like the current iteration of her own in its more straggling form. She had no examples of her former style, as all her notebooks from grad school and her early teaching life were locked in her office on campus, and she couldn't get to them. She had never had a curly, girly hand in particular, but somehow she remembered her previous specimens as a bit more rounded. These were scratchy and upright, more donnish to her eye. But that may simply have been the lack of exaggerated curves made by a wide nib pen. So much for material traces. What did that leave? Self-hypnosis. Maybe she could Skype with a medium who could advise on the parameters of automatic writing. She googled the intrusive texts. There were all from stories by M. R. James. Why Helena's self-doubt would take on this particular avatar was an open question. Her promotion brief was still pending. It seemed to her that this aberration was a marker of professional stress. M. R. James, as she assumed, would certainly not have approved her full professorship. She was a woman and a colonial. Her brand of literary criticism would have been unrecognisable to him, not scholarship at all. He hadn't even been a full professor himself, provost of King's College, director of the Fitzwilliam Museum, but not a full professor. Her brief would be pending for a year. Was she going to spend twelve months putting up with snide remarks from an old-school codicologist? It would be impossible to please. Opportunities to exercise the kind of expertise he had once had were rare in Canada, even rarer now that no one could travel to foreign libraries. Instead of articles on Middle English, perhaps she should take up writing porn. James had been notoriously fastidious. If her notes became suddenly graphic, uh, he would surely go away. But then porn was ghastly and bored her to death. Its omnipresence was one of those things she simply couldn't understand. Like Twitter. After all, as she told herself soothingly, all professional women run into horrible old men who seek to wound them at one time or another. It's just that these men are usually still living. To be entertaining the censure of a colleague who had died in 1936 seemed unusual. On the other hand, if it were actually possible, it would be ubiquitous. In the sciences, there was an ever-growing list of women who were and are excluded from patents and prizes. In the humanities, where there are fewer patents and prizes, maybe the equivalent was this kind of beyond-the-grave hazing. Should she ask her female colleagues about it? Had any of them been harassed by dead men in their fields when they sought promotion? Could it be grieved? She carried on assembling her notes. The materials were diverse and interesting. Certain stories cropped up again and again in various guises. 
A persistent one was shopping for a religion. The primary chronicle of Kievan Rus had their leader, Vladimir, upon deciding that it was no longer acceptable to be pagan for reasons of trade, convene a meeting of representatives from the three major monotheisms, Judaism, Christianity and Islam. A priest from each faith spoke his peace. Vladimir rejected Islam out of hand because of its taboo against drinking and was unimpressed with Judaism as the Jews had lost their capital of Jerusalem and reserved judgment on Christianity. He then sent out emissaries to examine the faiths of the region in situ. Orthodox and Roman Christianity were the two major contenders and orthodoxy won hands down as soon as the Rus got one look at Hagia Sophia and its splendid ritual. That was that. Vladimir married a Greek princess and had everyone in his city forcibly baptised in the Dnieper, man, woman and child, on pain of death. A different variation was available to explain the religion of Khazaria. This powerful Khaganate had been at least mythically run by Jews. An oft-repeated story of the 11th century had an originary leader of this empire, Bulan, convene a similar meeting. Unable to decide between the three options, he cannily asked the proponent of Islam which of his two rival religions would be more acceptable to him. The man replied, Judaism. Bulan then asked the Christian which of his two rival religions would be more acceptable. He likewise said Judaism. The king and his courtiers accordingly adopted the Jewish religion, though they continued to preside ecumenically over a multi-faith population, particularly in their great and now lost city of Itil. Helena had yet to find a version of this debate tale in which the ruler declared for Islam, possibly because that religion had been so overwhelmingly successful throughout the region that it needed no apologists. Only the Mongol invasions of the 13th century had caused a bit of a rollback. Genghis Khan, who knew that he was well on the way to becoming a god himself, was unmoved by proselytizing monotheists. However, in his vast empire he tolerated them all, in addition to Tengrists and Buddhists of several stripes. The sheer scale of the cultural activity on the Central Asian steppe, the numbers of people, languages and religions involved, the time scale and the distances people migrated, made the European history of the period to which he was accustomed look very, very small. There was a certain comedy in being concerned about what a couple of insular chuckleheads in York and London thought about it all. Amateur, repeated M. R. James, Jagged Arrow. Helena felt that she was obliged to accept this zinger from a man who had been able to compare the Greek and Ethiopic versions of the book of Baruch while still in elementary school. How had the 14-year-old James ever hit upon Baruch? He had, apparently, translated it from Amharic while still at Eton. A couple of lines from Baruch were included in the Anglican Christmas liturgy. Perhaps that was it. Christmas had always been a crucial time for the mature James, the point in the year at which he would trot out his latest ghost stories for a small fireside audience at King's College. Dickens had started that vogue, of course. Replacing the primary haunting of the season, the one of which Mary had been informed at the Annunciation, with a safer one. What ghost is more terrible than the Holy Ghost? Meanwhile, the news got worse. The murder of a black man by a policeman in Minneapolis caused a wave of protests across the United States. Hundreds of thousands of people, defying whatever protocols their local governments had managed to set up in the face of the apathy and denial of the central administration surged together, breathing one another's air and fury. Scenes of apocalyptic unreason swept through the media. A plague makes some things clear. If the poor and disenfranchised are dying anyway, why should they not meet on the barricades? What have they got to lose? They are already the walking dead. Still, watching them walk and scream and rage only to be crushed by police armed like zombie hunters was horrific. A communicable disease shows us all too plainly the truth that crowds of people are toxic to each other. Stress levels rose in Helena's household. Not so much with her, as she had long since learned to live in a near-total media blackout and saw little of it, but the kids were jittery. 
Searches on COVID-19 symptoms rose appreciably. Tabs were opened on Spanish flu, cholera and Ebola. A few on structural racism and rioting. Helena insisted that the family watch Les Miserables. She began to write an initial draft of her article, which meant composing more on screen. It was simply too slow in longhand. The floating print problem cropped up again. She would lie awake at night with one of her more lacklustre sentences, the one she had stared at longest in order to cut or revise, floating above her face at a distance of about three feet, like something out of a horror movie. There is a long-standing debate in historiography about the extent to which pre-modern people believed their histories to be fact and how far fact is understood to be from story. The words would hang there tidily in Times New Roman from 20 to 40 minutes until something or other happened to her optic nerve and they would fade away. One night at around 1am after a day in which family distraughtness had generally been high and Helena felt sure that both kids were still lying bug-eyed in their beds with their ear pods in, the following sentence appeared as she closed her eyes. Awake, he remained in any case, long enough to fancy, as I am afraid I often do myself under such conditions, that he was the victim of all manner of fatal disorders. He would lie counting the beats of his heart, convinced that it was going to stop work every moment, and would entertain grave suspicions of his lungs, brain, liver, etc. She had not read this sentence on her backlit screen that day. It hung there, wavering slightly in a taunting manner. She was certain it was James. After a moment, as it refused to go away, she turned the light on and looked up the text. It was from O oh, Whistle and I'll Come to You, My Lad, the story in which there is a certain amount of sinister insomnia. As she scrolled through the story on Project Gutenberg, indeed, just as she found the sentence in question, it occurred to her, with a genuine thrill of horror, that she had never actually seen that sentence before. She had only heard it as an audiobook recording. For some reason, this realisation was appalling. It emphasised the craziness of the whole business. Entire bodily systems were being hijacked. They were being cross-wired. M.R. James in her head. Is there insane synesthesia? When she turned the light off and lay back down, trying to pretend she was calm, only a fragment of the utterance was left, hanging in the dark, as I am afraid I often do myself under such conditions. The next morning she checked her browser history to make sure she had not read any M.I. James. She hadn't. She had none in print. She had heard the stories read aloud. Her visionless brain had set them in the air in Times New Roman. She tried to picture herself explaining this in an online chat to her GP. It did not seem to merit breaking quarantine and trying to get into the office or trying to admit herself through emergency. Hospitals were crammed. M.R. James was not urging her to self-harm or to harm others. Disapproving of her application for promotion, if that's what it was, surely counted as non-urgent. Gaslighting, of course, is regularly taken to be non-urgent. That is why it works. But then his most recent communication might be construed as one of solidarity. She talked it over with her husband. He agreed it was weird, but said that it was just her unique way of coping with lockdown, uh, promotion anxiety, and headlines full of imminent doom. M.R. James, eh? Haven't thought about him in years, if I ever have. Just think of him as a remote higher-up scrutinising your application. The provost, say. Someone you'll never even meet. Helena's provost was a Caribbean economist named Ram Kalawan. She wasn't sure that M.R. James would feel that he and this man were necessarily on the same side. This thought was rather liberating, considering that the provost actually existed. She went on drafting. What else was there to do? Who wants to do online yoga? M.R. James, it turned out, was a complicated man. There was Helena in her kitchen at 6pm, compounding jerk marinade. She had the recipe for this as a single sheet of A4, copied out of an ancient library book in her husband's spidery writing, 
which she had tucked years ago into her paperback copy of an excellent old book called Traditional Jamaican Cookery. Despite the excellence of the book, her husband's recipe was better. Public library cookbooks were one of the main reasons that two of them had survived grad school, both in terms of relief reading and the accumulation of practical kitchen skills. As her eyes watched the greenish-brown sludge whirling in the food processor, she saw superimposed over it at every blink. It is a very common thing, in my experience, to find papers shut up in old books, but one of the rarest things to come across any such that are at all interesting. Helena, who could cook dishes from three continents and a wide variety of outlying islands very creditably, experienced a flash of irritation. Shut up, James, you old snob! But then, how much cooking had he ever done? In this line, his expertise had probably been confined to making toast. She spent the next day struggling with the critical framing of her essay. This was always an exhausting process, like trying to fix the interpretive locus of a needle in a haystack. Retiring early with a headache that too much critical theory always gave her, she received, flickering like old film footage before her closed eyes, the following gruff concession. I didn't like to confess that this was beyond me. So, was this about the food or the critical theory? Imagining M.R. James eating, much less cooking, spicy jerk chicken was pure comedy. Picturing him trying to navigate the fearsome ideologies of present-day literary study verged on the pathetic. It would be about as successful as her attempt to translate the Book of Baruch. This short sentence dissolved unusually quickly. She was left, lying in the dark with her head pounding. She would frankly have welcomed another remark or two, just for the distraction. Listening one afternoon to the Tractate Midoth, which was clearly set in the Cambridge University Library, well before the open stacks or primitive computer catalogue of her day, suddenly recalled to her a story that she used to tell when drunk at cross-grained colonial parties during her PhD. It had actually happened to her in the reading room of the UL. This was a large and patrician room filled with long tables and reference books. Among the wide selection of books available there for people to seek out and pull off the shelves for themselves was the complete run of the Patrologia Latina. This took up two mid-length shelves in one quadrant of the room. On the opposite side of these shelves were the Patrologia Graeca volumes, which she never had any occasion to consult, as she knew no Greek. She did not like to imagine what might have happened to her had she ever ventured to that side of the shelf. Her encounter with the Latin fathers had been sufficiently damning. One afternoon she had had need of some book or other from the series that lay about midway along the shelf. The aisle between the Patrologia and whatever benighted Latin patristic sources lay opposite to it was quite narrow. It was tricky for two people to pass one another should they ever need to, which was, even in those days, not very often. She was making her way along toward the middle when suddenly, with lightning speed, a little old man in a drab suit with a toothbrush moustache was there before her. Blocking her way with his tiny form, he proceeded to look high up on the shelf and low down on the shelf and left and right along it. With a Canadian politeness at which she was absolutely infuriated and yet could not repress, she had had to stand there for fully ten minutes while he deliberately and with great ingenuity prevented her access to these monuments of masculine wisdom. His eyes gleamed with silent malice. She had stood there fuming, wondering if perhaps she ought to volunteer to lift him up to some of the higher volumes, as it was well within her capacity, and certainly not his, until he made a feint and retreated a few steps. Able to move along toward her goal, she was just stretching out her hand toward the volume in question when he snatched it and scuttled, crab-like, away. This evil sprite of the Patrologia Latina was, in her opinion, entirely the equal of the desiccated, cobwebbed and extremely dead clergyman who had haunted the Hebrew stacks, accompanied by a dreadful smell of must in James's story. God knows, it had probably been the same man. 
there is no prescribed place for this, so far as I know, came up rather primly in the note she had resumed taking not long after, as soon as she had retold the tale to her husband, who snorted reminiscently. Could this be an apology? It sounded conciliatory. Did James disapprove of such misogynistic rudeness? And further, did this imply that he had overheard her? She had not included the library anecdote in her notes. She had merely spoken it aloud to Phil. This increase in James's ambit was worrying. Had he been hanging around in some ghostly fashion as she played the recording of the tractate mid-off? When she retired to her bed that night, to her surprise, she was abruptly confronted behind her eyelids by the stentorian tag, Quis es iste qui venit? This made her giggle, the use of Latin in any kind of horror is funny. But she could not help thinking that this was exactly what had been running through the mind of the man with the toothbrush moustache as he had watched her progress up the Patrologia Isle. Who is this who comes? The fact that women had not been allowed into the university library until 1854 was actually a central point in a denouement of the Tractate Midoth. Was M. R. James making a joke, uh, sharing a joke with her, a Latin joke? The capital letters faded quickly and were replaced. Hanging there jauntily in their stead was, Now, years ago, I took great pains to learn the Latin language, and on many occasions I have found it most useful. Whatever you may see to the contrary in the newspaper, but seldom or never have I found it more useful than now. Helena thought of J.K. Rowling, earner of the highest grossing classics degree of all time. Not one of James's old Etonians had even come close to her, despite their looting of India. Did he know that? Had he, perhaps, read Harry Potter through her eyes? Tolle lege. She tried vainly to remember if she had re-read any of the series since her promotion brief had been submitted. Rolling aside, however, it was certainly Helena's facility in Latin and other antiquarian subjects that had secured her a stable university job, for which she had a special reason to be presently thankful. Her job was secure, and it was one that could be done in a meaningful way remotely. Surely we can say that a medievalist always works remotely. Her scientist friends were going mad. Scientists need labs and extraordinary numbers of machines and flunkies to do anything. They can't accomplish much alone. The letters faded slowly from her inner sight, with great pains hanging on the longest, like the smile of the Cheshire cat. By July it was hot. Enormous storm systems rolled over southern Ontario like steam trains. The temperature was regularly over 30 degrees. There were tornado warnings. A hailstorm flattened half the tomatoes. Humidity was so high that having to wear masks in public was a serious trial. People were seen carrying them by hand, limp and soggy, and snapping them on five seconds before ducking into the air conditioning of the pharmacy or grocery store. Some people gave up on masks entirely. There was more general chafing, complaint and denial about COVID-19 restrictions. These had been eased but were by no means gone. Stir-crazy toddlers and preschoolers, deprived of play parks and splash pads, drove their parents wild at home. Older kids, now that the last of their feeble online classes had petered out, had even more time on their hands. Options for summer jobs or camps or sports were minimal to non-existent. The internet seethed with pornographic rage. A lot of the workforce was still out of work, savings were spent, and many people who had been doing okay getting by six months ago were now desperate. The government was pouring out relief money like water. Universities set up student assistance funds. Helena paid into one and Phil another. He had taken up learning a whole lot of tricky new Chopin and when the timings got too maddening, he would flee outside and trim something savagely with shears. She was at the time-frittering, footnoting stage of the article, a phase with which he had never been patient. Thunder rolled continuously, and there was night after night of sheet lightning. 
The cool, damp, candlelit atmosphere of M. R. James's tales became a sensory relief. At night, Helena lay naked under a ceiling fan going full tilt with brackets and colons flashing before her weary eyes, listening to stories set in Viborg and Felixstowe, where cold sea winds were always blowing. After a certain point, wondering about James's unusual silence, it occurred to her that female nudity was likely to keep him away indefinitely. She was not sure how she felt about this. It was hard not to sympathise with a man who wrote tales in which two men who lived together in the country were automatically suspected of necromancy, yet there were others in which men lying innocently in bed were attacked by hairy-toothed vaginas and had to retire, trembling, to wake all night in another room fearing a fate worse than death. There was a persistent association of women with spiders. As she faffed around with the expiring corpse of her essay, the final edit was something that she always thought of as akin to embalming, the general smoothing down and tucking in and rendering unexceptionable, and the plague-stricken world at large reeled apocalyptically forward, new waves of the disease striking all the time. James remained persistently silent. It occurred to Helena that he had lived through the Spanish flu epidemic of 1918. She wondered how many people he knew had died in it, not to mention all the patrician boys from Eton and Cambridge, his students, who had perished horribly in the war. And upon his death in 1936, the world had been rousing itself fitfully and gruesomely for World War II. Oh, whistle and I'll come to you, my lad. If he was reading the news along with her, perhaps he just did not want to go through it all again. Hauntings may be said to move in both directions. Who says the ghosts are having fun? Helena got rid of her article. She sent it off to the editorial board of Reticulum, and it became their problem. There it would languish for the next year or so, seeking peer review and provisional acceptance and the inevitable revisions required by the anonymous readers consisting of citations of particular works that, of course, were their own, followed by line editing, the painful making up of abstracts and keywords for online databases, and finally, publication. This could be counted on two or three years after submission. Helena had once unwisely complained about this pace to a colleague in media studies whose research domain was confined to a movable 20-minute window and had been told with cheerful dismissal that after all, Middle English wasn't going anywhere, was it? Would this be the end of her spectral correspondence with M.R. James? She had no other immediate research plan in view, and it did not seem probable that he would linger in order to comment on her domestic life, even though her promotion brief was still pending. She wouldn't be writing any more notes for a while. She had contemplated starting a journal, but she wasn't the journaling type. She always found other people's lives more interesting than her own. She had false started on a number of journals over the years, but they had always withered away. She would watch people in cafes scribbling indefatigably in mock leather notebooks and wonder what on earth they were saying. Her daughter filled volumes of them about which she had no curiosity whatsoever. Her only other option would be to take up golf, which, judging from its prevalence in his fiction, must have been the other passion in the life of James. This was about as likely as belly dancing. She loathed golf. Plus, golf courses across the globe were still closed, though she supposed they were among the likeliest of all sporting venues to reopen soon, as capable of accommodating social distancing quite easily. Golf has always been about social distancing. As she folded a stack of towels some days later, a large stack, as her appeals to her teenage children to use them more than once usually fell on deaf ears, she reflected that throughout the oeuvre of M. R. James there is a pervasive fear of laundry. It is, of course, doubtful that James ever did any of his own laundry. The story for which he is probably most famous, O oh, Whistle and I'll Come to You, My Lad, features a set of bedsheets that become horribly animated. In other stories, there's a wide array of creepy draperies. There's a set of self-rustling curtains that spawn a creeping creature composed out of dry hair, 
In the numerous walking or crawling figures of horror that he invents, there's considerable emphasis on their cowls, cloaks, capes and other flowing garments. Academic gowns, by which he would have been continually surrounded, must have given him some anxiety. What was that about? Had he glimpsed something horrid in the hamper as a child? But then, the ability to see the uncanny in the everyday is the mark of the weird fiction writer generally. There are no exotic locations in James, no alien landscapes. His protagonists are usually going about their scholarly business in places no more picaresque than East Anglia. Into uptight, arid lives, inexplicable terrors intrude, sometimes fatally, often just enough to unsettle all certitudes. They come with a dry rustle, the kind of sound you might hear in a library. Moths beating, pages turning. Nothing squelchy or tentacular for M. R. James. As she thought about all this, Helena found that the slight friction noises emitted by the towels as their terry fibres rubbed across one another gave her a certain frisson. Frisson and friction are, after all, etymologically related. She considered various comedy monsters her family had made up. The sock monster, for example, who lurked in the basement, stealing and eating single socks, or the kusikin, a tiny creature formed of lint who farmed and ate dust balls in the same locality. They seemed less funny and more threatening than they had before when they had featured in bedtime stories. The scrabbling of squirrels inside the house walls to which she had formerly been resigned began to wake her up at night. Domestic flies, unavoidable in summer, began to freak her out. They reminded her of a hellish plague of flies in a particular James story. She travelled the house with a fly swatter. All in all, she was tense. It was now that something happened, of which I can certainly not yet see the import fully. Such was the bulletin she received from M. R. James inside her waking eyelids on the morning of the day she received an apologetic form letter from her old Cambridge college about their handling of an inquiry into complaints of assault and uh, sexual misconduct, one that was rapidly becoming a scandal in the British press. James, former Vice-Chancellor of Cambridge, evidently remained attuned to the problems of its public image, even from beyond the grave. Helena was accustomed to throwing out or deleting all communications from her old college unread. They were simply dressed-up demands for money that she had no intention of giving them in a world of far more deserving and needy parties. It was remarkable that she had even glanced at this one. It was as if she had been primed by James's earlier enigmatic statement. She thought wryly that she could pretty well guess James's sentiments on this topic, and sure enough, all she had to do was close her eyes some minutes later to read the expostulation. The examination of these records demanded a very considerable expenditure of time. Helena was angry. Her inner monologue for the rest of the day was full of brutal remarks to or about M. R. James. She read everything she could find about the college crisis. She read a number of classic feminist essays for James's edification and several Wikipedia articles about rape culture. No doubt it was all news to him, she fumed inwardly. She went to bed drunk and cranky and soon received the following communique haloed in orange light. It is to be supposed that he made himself very agreeable to the servants, for within ten days of his coming they were almost falling over each other in their efforts to oblige him. At the same time, Mrs. Ashton was rather put to it to find new maid-servants, for there were several changes, and some of the families in the town from which she had been accustomed to draw seemed to have no one available. She was forced to go further afield than was usual. This was singularly unhelpful. It was hatefully irrelevant. Helena sat up and did some eyeful googling and checking of text in Project Gutenberg. The results brought her temper up short. 
The eerie paragraph was from the story The Thin Ghost, which concerns a patrician boy named Saul, a plausible and well-bred young man being looked after by clueless and self-satisfied guardians. He proves to be a necromancer, performing weird rites and raising the local dead. And, as the paragraph, still flickering before her eyes at each blink, made ironically clear, he had also been a domestic predator, abusing the servants and, particularly, the maidservants. So, the cold fate meted out to him in the story had been, among other things, the punishment of a rapist, one harboured in an educated and elite household that had turned a blind eye to what he was doing. Here was James once again, finding the horrific in the commonplace. The paragraph hung there blandly for the usual forty minutes or so and then faded away. Helena felt chastened. It occurred to her to wonder, for the first time, if this whole hallucinatory business with M. R. James was a two-way street. Had she managed, in her brief programme of feminist reading, to change his mind? Is it possible for the recalcitrant dead to be re-educated? Helena's eyesight continued to deteriorate. It was alarming, as well as exceedingly frustrating. She wasn't quite fifty and had the visual acuity of an eighty-year-old with dual cataracts. The interrelated facts that she had brought this on herself by going in for voluntary surgery for no better reason than vanity, and that in normal circumstances it could all be cleared up in a two-minute burst from a laser, haunted her constantly. She had to give up showering because the all-white interior of the shower became terminally confusing, and she couldn't navigate the space. She had always preferred baths anyway, but was perversely upset about this, raging about it to Phil, who could do nothing but shrug. Oh, she thought, he shrugged. Her children's faces looked like she was peering at them through a pane smeared with Vaseline. Teaching term was coming, and it was becoming increasingly clear to her that she was going to have to ask for some kind of accommodation or reduction of workload. It took her a very long time to read anything on screen, and the little talking heads on Zoom were impossible to see. Never having had to do anything of the kind before, she found it horrifying. One conversation with the occupational health liaison for her faculty about options for using speech software for the visually impaired reduced her to tears. She felt she had maxed out her ability to deal with new software in the general chaos of the online pivot. The stuff was expensive, complicated, and she would only need it for a couple of months until the medical system opened up a bit and she could get into the eye clinic. In the end, she opted for a course reduction for one term. The whole thing made her feel inadequate, but for the first time she was faced by a hard physical limit. She tried to think of this as instructive. After all, it had happened to Milton. In his case, there had been no possibility of amelioration. A brain that had spent most of its time processing text had had to make its own radical adjustment to composing blind. This he had done, of course, magnificently, but in so doing he had used up the goodwill of his daughters, forced to read to him in languages they did not understand due to their own haphazard educations, and to transcribe hours of poetry from dictation by an irascible perfectionist, so that two out of the three of them never forgave him. Milton's daughters, unsung, unpaid, uncredited, had been the equivalent of the Zoom function on her iPad or the voice transcription software she had been offered by the occupational therapist. Invisible female labour. Invisible not only to the blind Milton. She found that she could still cook. She relied a lot on muscle memory and rarely cooked from recipes anyway. She had no fear of knives. She could watch television, which she still did regularly with Phil in the evenings. TV is so formulaic that she could follow it easily just by sound and blurred images. If anything, it sharpened her appreciation of the soundscape of most shows, which do much more work than she had previously understood. She learned indeed of a whole new class of person whose work she had never thought of before. Foley artists, professional noisemakers. They do a lot more for us than we think, if we are consumers of media. She also developed a new admiration for the voice work of actors, both those on television and those she heard on audiobooks. Not having to see them made her like them more. That was something. 
It was a slight increase in the number of things to like in the world. She took walks in her neighbourhood, staying on familiar routes. She noticed smells more, and she noticed the palpable quiet on many streets. People were not driving, not endlessly moving about as usual. It was like the social world had disappeared because she could no longer see it. God knows how many neighbours she offended by walking sightlessly right past them. But this kind of obliviousness had been characteristic of her even when she had had regular eyesight. As she walked, she reflected on the strange phenomenon she was experiencing with the floating text of M. R. James. These never seemed to afflict her when she was outside, perhaps because of the high light. She wasn't confident enough to go out in the dark any more. She couldn't distinguish anything. It was an indoor, readily phenomenon. James had been an indoor, readily man. It seemed proper to his person that she didn't hear his voice. He'd spent his life curating texts. It made sense that he would use snippets of them to communicate. It was a kind of sortes biblicae. She pictured the tweedy James chuckling softly to himself, copying lines from his collected works, a few here, a few there, in his rapid upright hand, onto small slips of paper, and then floating them along some stream of inner sight, where she, text-deprived, rose to them like a trout to bait. Was it just a parlour game, the kind of spooky game that might be played at Christmas, James's favourite season for ghost stories? or a more serious form of divination. Second sight, insight, compensation for going blind. Second sight, what kind of sight might that be? Came the sardonic words inside her eyelids as she lay down that night, full of wine and cop shows. It begins with, there is more in heaven and earth, appeared after that. This was decidedly snotty, but James had never been one for explanations. She was left pondering the heaven and earth remark for a long time. James had seemingly retreated back into whatever parallel universe he usually occupied. With her article done, and not much satisfaction to be gained from extra house cleaning, uh, what is the point if you can't see the result, Helena was left spinning her wheels. She spent her days shunting between a limited number of domestic spaces, bed, kitchen, couch, elliptical, elliptical kitchen couch bed. Such was, in the terminology of her teenage son, her grind set. Grind sweet? John the miller hath ground small, small, small. What was it? The king's son of heaven shall pay for all. She didn't think so. Jagged arrow. The peasant's revolt had long since failed. The apocalypse began 12,000 years ago with the Anthropocene. There's no paying that back. More things in heaven and earth, Horatio, you pedant, than are dreamt of in your philosophy, or even your philology. She really didn't want to begin another article. She had a list of possible topics, she always had a list, but there wasn't much incentive. What was she supposed to do with herself? She couldn't wait around indefinitely to hear back from her long-dead colleague. What would he have done, deprived of his libraries, with nothing to catalogue? He would have written more ghost stories, presumably, to add to his annual Christmas hoard. He would have turned to his other self, the one his medievalist colleagues did their best to ignore. She remembered Socrates, that smug little prat, listening to his mantic sign, writing a few lines of poetry while he waited for his hemlock to arrive, just in case he had been pursuing the wrong career all his life. If you like that story, Jagged consider Arrow. supporting she me as a patron. To write that way a story you help me make more about stories a for you and get access to a patron's only library of stories. Lots more hours for you to listen to. So hello, Sarah. Sarah told me. Great to have you here. It is lovely to be here. And I have been um, a fan of the classic ghost stories 
YouTube channel and podcast for a couple of years now. So this is actually quite thrilling. Oh, wow. Uh, it, it's amazing that it is a couple of years. I think it's going to be three years in September. Wild. We've just heard a story that you wrote, uh, The Hand of M.R. James. And that comes from your book, Sacraments for the Unfit. So which you kindly sent me all the way across the, the wild Atlantic. And I really liked the stories. I, um, but I thought the M.R. James one was possibly because, you know, he is the king of ghost stories, isn't he? So, uh, so I thought that was the one to do, really. And we can talk a little bit about the story. But first, tell me something about yourself. So uh, I am, by training, a medievalist. I, I went to the University of Toronto and then to Cambridge and did my PhD back in the 90s. And um, I worked at Harvard for a very short time. And then I was hired into my present job, which is at the University of Waterloo, uh, which is just about an hour kind of west of Toronto. And I have been teaching whatever medieval courses we offer, which alas are kind of a dwindling number. Um, a lot of kind of general British literature, and in the latter decade, a lot of creative writing, um, which is a growth area in our department, um, I think as in many North American departments right now. Um, and that follows on from uh, sort of a kind of rebirth, I guess, I experienced as a prose fiction writer and as a poet, uh, sort of... Indeed, as I was getting ready to uh, put in my tenure application way back in 2007 or so, I started quite unexpectedly, uh, certainly to me, to write um, what became my first novel, The Stone Boatman. And it finally was published in 2014, and I've published a great deal since then. So, in fact, I'm as much a kind of creative writer and creating, creative writing prof now as I, as I am a kind of traditional medievalist. So tell me, I mean, I do want to talk about your writing, but the the, the medievalist bit uh, yep. uh, is very interesting. I mean, that's very much in the in the uh, um, in, uh, not quite Mr. James, but it it's the general ballpark, isn't it? I mean, mm -hmm. he, a lot of his characters are antiquarian yes. and particularly going back to the medieval period. Yes. Yes. Um, so yep. so what did you what did you study particularly when you were well? I. I'm basically a, a, um, a Middle English scholar and a Middle Scots scholar. So I actually wrote my thesis on, uh, do you know the great big long poem, The Bruce? No. Uh, which is a sort of historical national epic kind of thing uh, in Scots. It's a, it's a lovely text, uh, quite exciting and very interesting, actually. Um, so that was really the main topic of my dissertation although I have not really published a great deal on it or uh, spent too much time on it since then. I, I got interested in the, uh, the bureaucrat poet, Thomas Hockleave, who lived just one generation after Chaucer and is kind of famous for going mad and documenting his own madness in his poetry wow. as he held down his bureaucratic job in the Privy Seal. So he was kind of like the proto uh, naked civil servant <laughs> so I worked on him for a while, and I've worked a great deal on the long, weird, myriad dream vision poem, The Vision of Pierce the Plowman, which is a, a wonderful and strange composite work. There's nothing else like it. And I, I am absolutely certain, really, that it was that text in particular that kind of allowed me to become the sort of weird fiction writer that I did become. So the uh, medieval, Eng and it's a Northern English dialect, isn't it, Pierce Plowman, or, or is it Midland? It's, uh, that one actually, there are several different versions of it. So in fact, there are versions of it in almost all, all the main dialects. But I mean, really, to be fair, I would say that it's largely in a series of London and London adjacent dialects. Okay, okay, fair enough. So yeah, I was completely wrong there. Well, the literary style is totally more of a Northern thing, to be fair. And yeah, and it is, it is that. Yeah. So, you know, I feel really embarrassed now that I don't know anything about medieval Scots. So the, the, the Bruce poem, what years does it come from? It comes from, it's, it's uh, roughly the same period as Chaucer, sort of third quarter of the 14th century. So it's narrating, uh, you know, with a strong backwards glance, you know, to events at the kind of beginning of that century. And it is, I mean, it was basically propaganda. <laughs> um, uh, but propaganda of a kind of quite of high literary order, and it's extremely interesting. The language is very racy and cool. I mean, Scots is just extremely cool. Is the fact of it? It's the yeah, yeah. funky Germanic language, um, 
uh, with you know a certain amount of Celtic loanword and stuff, but really it is uh, it's a it's a Germanic language, and you know the Scots that is written uh, and spoken now uh, has undergone some serious changes from that version of it, and it kind of really changed a lot, sort of in Shakespeare's day and a little bit later, but uh, but um, yes, uh, so it's um, always been a kind of sort of backburnered interest of of mine. And uh, maybe I will actually get back to it at some point uh, in the future. Well, probably you, people are more who are listening to this are probably more interested in the story. But I'm sorry to have been uh, that really sparked my interest there anyway. So, so strangely, Pierce Plowman mm -hmm. somehow uh, opened the floodgates of creativity for you. It really did, um, most uh, unexpectedly. Uh, I had been a poet years ago as an undergrad, uh, you know, and really enjoyed it and wrote a lot. And then I think as happens to many people who go to grad school, you just become utterly crushed. <laughs> so I uh, really, I mean, I wrote a lot of academic stuff, obviously, over that sort of decade, but I certainly didn't do any creative writing. And I had never succeeded in getting any long fiction off the ground. And then most strangely, I started writing this book that... I mean, this sounds so cheesy, but it's true. I, I know it came to me in a dream. I actually had a little dream vision uh, of a kind of night scene. Uh, and I wrote that little scene and then I just gradually added more and more to it on, in my hour and a half commute by bus uh, three days a week. It was the only time I had to work on it. And eventually it ended up being this long historical fantasy four-part novel that, to my mind, is kind of a rewrite of Pierce Plowman. I don't know if you subscribe to this view, but, it, you know, it, it, there are certain schools that think that what you write is in some kind of sense a um, conversation with your, you know, let's not get too deep, but why not, with your soul or, or whatever makes you tick, some kind of your unconscious or whatever, you know, it's talking to you, mm -hmm. so... Uh, that would tie in with that, but I don't know yeah. if you believe that. Well, I mean, what I found and what I, you know, I've, I found then and what I still find now is the experience of writing creatively for me, which is different from writing scholarly work, you know, is that you really are writing kind of from an unknown to an unknown. Like, I never know what the hell I'm doing, right? I don't write plans. I do not have chapter outlines. I literally just feel it forward from one paragraph to the next one, to the next one. Um, you know, just making tiny little kind of, I almost think of them as like little Velcro closures. I, I leave little hooks in one paragraph, which I then just delicately hook on <laughs> the next one to, you know. And that is the process and the only process I've ever had. And it does have a curious open-ended magic to it. There's nothing else like it. Um, I'm not entirely certain where the story material comes from, and I never ever know where it's going. <laughs> I just do it. I don't want to jump forward too far because I, do, I want to, you know, kind of um, resist the temptation just to grab a little bit from the hand of M.R. James and then come back to talk about, you know, what we're talking about. We're kind of establishing background first, aren't we? Mm -hmm. But. Um, yeah, no, but but the, the hand of M.R. James was a very, yeah, uh, you know, very neatly constructed story. So did that come almost fully formed? Yes, it 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 did actually. That story, um, unlike some of the other ones in that book, um, really came quite directly in that long form draft. I mean, it, it was twiddled around, and certain things were you know expanded a little bit. The first version was a little bit shorter, but that one was, I think, very much about the kind of minute-to-minute -minute atmospheric uh, sort of growth of that thing. It's also the only story I've ever written that is really at all autobiographical. That protagonist definitely is based on me and my experience during COVID, in which I was, in fact, losing my vision. <laughs> um, and quite a few of those sort of, you know, somatic experiences that uh, Helena has are ones that I had myself. Even the the blinking and the print thing happened to Is me. Is that true? <laughs> yeah, yeah, really. Wow. Uh, so, uh, and it just somehow I realized 
um, that for the first time it was actually going to be okay to write a contemporary story set today in which there was a protagonist who was somewhat like myself. Mostly my fictions are very estranged from my subject position, you know, but... Um, this was definitely an academic writing. You could, totally, you could yeah, feel yeah. It, you know, uh, and of course, by that, and of course, recently I did um, uh, um, a uh, Robertson Davis uh, story, um, The Ghost That Disappeared by Degrees. Yes, yeah. Banished by Degrees, rather, you know, and that is, and so, of course, him being Canadian and you being Canadian and... Uh, and being academics and writing about um, the supernatural within academia. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Really, within the process, because I don't know if you remember that story, that's about this guy going for his PhD, and, and he's examined by the ghosts, and he has to do his viva for the ghosts and things. Uh, and um, and then he ends up uh, studying millions of different uh, things. So you could, you know, Robertson Davis, obviously, that was his life as well. Yes. Uh, and, and so when I was reading yours, I thought, ah, oh, right, okay, okay. You know, this was, it was, it, it was too, well, if you told me that you were really a pearl fisherman, uh, <laughs> I would be like, uh, be okay. Yeah. But, you know, yeah, I'd be surprised. But I read that and thought, no, this is, this is authentic. This is what you do, yeah, you know. Yeah. Um, so, Amr James, then, why, why him? Why him? Well, it is actually true that I did simply stumble across. I think it was first. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard the recordings by Peter Yearsley that he did for LibriVox of the whole antiquaries. Well, he's he's a very nice reader, very you know calm and soporific and low key. But he, you know, so I, I, I stumbled across those as I myself was going through this low vision episode. And then I sort of started sniffing around online and I found yours. <laughs> and I also found uh, Greg Wagland's um, oh, uh, yeah, Sherlock, Sherlock Holmes, Holmes, you know. Yeah. So I was sort of saturated in that, that this kind of turn of the century sort of bohemian bachelor fiction of, of two different stripes. And I mean, James, I actually have seen manuscripts that he annotated. You know, in my, yeah, in my paleography courses in Cambridge, I'm not a paleographer really by training, but everybody does have to do some, and I have indeed done some. And I've seen his, his you know, quite pristine, upright hand commenting on this or that or the other. Um, there are literally hundreds and hundreds of manuscripts that he has commented on and left notes on in all of the major libraries right across the UK. So it's not hard to find them. Yeah, I... I, um, I I've been reading his letter, his letters, and I was reading through, and, and you know, and he he's going round different countries, looking at manuscripts and collecting manuscripts and working on manuscripts. And as you say, so yeah, he was he was an industrious guy. Yes, yeah, he was one of those kind of tireless, tireless Victorians, you know, or I guess Edwardians, you know. Um, yes, uh, so I mean, I did know about him as a as a codicologist way back in the day. But I don't think I was aware of his ghost story output at all, except perhaps as casually mentioned kind of thing. But it certainly didn't come up in any of my classes or any of that kind of thing. But because I was sort of already thinking back to sort of perhaps that period in my career or, you know, this sort of my self-construction or whatever it might have been, it somehow just twigged it. And then I was listening to these recordings as well. So there was a sort of atmosphere of haunting <laughs> uh, naturally spun up. But of course, there's this tradition. There's a tradition of um, people having their daemons. I think, it, is it Socrates yes, who listened to his, his uh, and this, uh, it, you know, not demons, but, you know. Uh, yeah, his mantic sign, you know, yeah. His, his mantic, absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, I'm a, I'm a big fan of Jung, and he had Philemon who came to him and talked to him and, and in a, in a similar way, these inner figures, and yours happened to be M.R. James. M.R. James, yeah. <laughs> I, I was really into Marla at one point, and I was walking out, and I saw him. He was standing there, uh, and then he vanished. I thought, whoa, that was Gustav Mahler. Um, and so I think, you know, if you if you do spend time thinking about these characters, they can kind of um, have an influence on you. So, But, what you know, why do you think, I mean, obviously... If it hadn't been M.R. James, we wouldn't have probably read that story. But why, why M.R. James of every of anybody in the world? Yes, it's a good it's a good question. I mean, some of it was that he too was doing that kind of 
uneasy straddle between being a creative writer and, and especially like a weird ghost writer and a straight up academic. That's always a kind of uncomfortable um, sort of stretch and the, the two kind of communities or constituencies that you address do not speak nicely to one another <laughs> very often, you know, so there's that. Um, and it's also the, um, I think it was that, you know, his stories themselves have a kind of tentativeness and a darkness and a, a kind of inconclusiveness, um, which I particularly felt, I kind of really felt I needed the contrast with that very brash, assured, no problem thing that you get from reading Sherlock Holmes or hearing it, you know. Uh, he was sort of the uh, other <laughs> Sherlock Holmes, as it were, um, because all of his protagonists are rather hapless. You know, they get themselves into these situations just by their sheer scholarly interest in X, Y, or Z. And then they're just kind of slowly overcome by whatever uncanny experience unfolds. You know, they're not always sharply ended or sharply drawn out. Very few people die. There's not too much violence. It's just, uh, again, it's the unknown quantity that they are facing and that they never fully digest or come to terms with. And that always did strike me as as very, you know, emotionally real. I think that's his great, the reason that people keep going back to him, because he has these these weirdnesses that are never really resolved or even completely explained. Yes, exactly. And I liked that about him. And, it, and, and in fact, weirdly, it's one of the things I've always loved about Pierce Plowman, um, uh, in, in that it too is a poem in which almost anything can happen. Any transient thought can be personified and speak to you for a while. Characters are popping up out of the landscape and then disappearing. Uh, you know, the protagonist meets an exact double of himself walking along a road. It's filled with uncanny and weird events that simply are required to get this emotional or intellectual point across. They're used for a while and then they're just dropped and we just go along, you know? And um, I, I, I like that. Like a dream. Like a dream, you know, d dreams are like that. They just fill you. You're, you're, you're on a boat and you're doing something and the next minute you're sitting in a library, you know, or, or whatever. Uh, yeah, I, I, you know, so I, I'm going to make some notes of things I need to go off and read after we've finished. And one being Pierce Plowman, the other one I'm going to look at the Bruce as well. I recommend them both highly, yeah. You, you seem surprised that it was funny. Well, I think it's funny <laughs> and I did write it to be funny, but um, I think there's often a sort of resistance among weird fiction readers to humor that somehow it will wreck the tone, you know? Um, but in fact, I actually find the James stories are rather funny in parts. You know, they, they have this kind of dry, ironic humor uh, you know, built in at a low level. And and certainly this book, The Sacraments for the Unfit book, which is quite diverse. It's a it's a it's a very a weird bunch of tales <laughs> within a variety of different styles. But I mean, in fact, many of them are quite humorous, but they're also very dark. Uh, it didn't strike me as dark, this story. I, I thought it was, I thought it was a very witty story. Mm -hmm. No, you know, that. Yeah, you're right. I don't I mean, it's a ghostly story. Uh, and indeed, it is perhaps one of of two stories in that book that are actually sort of about something that would resemble a haunting. That one and the the one called Honey Business, where there's some kind of imminent backyard deity <laughs> that definitely gets into a relationship with that protagonist. Um, so those are sort of some kind of ghostly encounters. Um, they're yeah, they're a bit wistful. Um, they're um, but I mean, they're, I don't know, they're serious, if you know what I mean. Um, but I think the humor is actually very much part of them. It, it's intrinsic to them. I mean, there is a certain kind of comedy in finding yourself ridiculously having this conversation with the ghost of M.R. James, <laughs> you know, or, you know, we are worrying that, uh, you know, uh, um, some some sort of possible local deity is, is living in your backyard and, and accidentally lighting up your, um, you know, your fake 
wasp nest. <laughs> you know, just it, it is part of that uh, the experience of horror in some ways, or the experience of the uncanny. Uncanny, you know, can be kind of funny. She's applying for promotion, isn't she? Mm. And Mr. James appearing is related to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what is what is he, what is he for? What's his intervention for? Yeah, well, I mean, I think, um, you know, it starts out actually rather adversarial. You know, she thinks that he is going to be, you know, a kind of Procrustean old fogey. He's going to be sexist. He's going to disapprove of her, you know, her entire scholarly style, which is modern and not at all like his. You know, it's not a, a, a paleography based uh, scholarly um, project at all, you know. So she fears that that is what it's going to be, that it's going to be some sort of punishing policing encounter. And she sort of expresses some anxiety about that at the beginning of the story, but then it just kind of morphs as it goes along. And what it kind of becomes by the end, perhaps not with like a huge amount of fanfare, but because we have that sort of full circle ending where she decides now she's you know gotten rid of her article and doesn't know what to do next as a scholar, that she's actually going to write the story of the medievalist who is haunted by the hand of MR. It turns on that. It ties it up neatly in a bow, I think. I, I, I like that ending. It, it felt good. Good, because I wondered about it myself. For, you know, I, I knew it was going to, or at least by the time I was three quarters through, I was fairly sure it was going to end there, but then I thought it might be twee. <laughs> you know, oh no. It felt uh, symmetrical, you know. It, it felt good. That that I thought that was a good way to end it. Yeah, so he becomes enabling, actually, in the end, therefore, because he sort of models for her this other kind of writing and sort of, you know, kind of, you know, it's a sort of, you know, shit or get off the pot kind of thing, right? <laughs> you know, just do it now, you know. And I hadn't appreciated that until you just said it then, that really uh, uh, she has been a, an academic writer up until that point. And going forward, the thing that she's going to write is not. An, and and you kind of said before that um, the, the crusty academics or the serious academics potentially look down their nose at uh, this kind of genre fiction. I mean, perhaps even even if she'd been writing the great um, the great novel, you know, of manners, uh, they probably still would have looked down their nose. But um, but the fact that it's a piece of genre, a ghost story, uh, makes it even less. Um, uh, what's the word? You know, if they're being a bit snobbish about it, yeah. I was I was just thinking. I I didn't think of this as I was writing, and I think I only thought of it the other day as I was you know, thinking ahead to this uh, conversation. Have you read A.S. Wyatt's Possession? Yes, yeah, loved it, yeah, loved it. You remember that, the ending there, where uh, where the, I've, I can't even remember I read it. Name. I read it about 25 years ago, so. Yeah, me too, uh, it was so long ago that I, I it's not. Yeah, it's fantastic. I, re I read it twice, what, right off the bat, actually, yeah. But that's also a moment where that essentially academic kind of invested character, the young one, you know, kind of just in the last few pages of the novel, tries his hand at poetry and is reinvented. And the whole work, to some extent, has actually been tending in that direction all along. Um, but it, it just sort of suddenly clicks into place. You know, it can almost feel a little bit too pat. You're like, oh, is that really going to, can I, am I, am I, you know, do I buy this? But I think in the end, I did buy it. And it's something similar. Oh, did I buy it? Because it was buy it. <laughs> oh, dear. Uh -huh. um, yeah. Puns. You can't stop yourself, can you? You know? Um, yeah. So it, it struck me as, as, as kind of repeating that uh, kind of sort of a Kunstler Roman thing. As you're saying that about your story, it does appear that there is this uh, very high bound uh, community whereby you do things according to the way things are done, peer peer approval and process and then there's a far more solitary creative um and ironically you have been studying the produce of that creativity in the bruce and you know other things of course piers plowman and you're saying about and that is this that's what you're doing that's what you've shifted over to do yeah it, it you know you you cross the floor <laughs> right yeah, you cross the fire exactly, and and you're and in Mr. James in the hand of Mr. James that enabled by James in a sense and by his weird intervention, um, she she is able to do that. 
as you yourself have done them. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So that was very autobiographical in, in that sense. <laughs> okay. So finally, uh, what we need to say is how do people get hold of a copy of this book? Uh, this book can be ordered from Amazon. It can be also ordered directly from the press, which is called Aqueduct Press, uh, which is uh, Aqueduct out of uh, Seattle. They also have their own website. Um, if you go to my own site, I'm not selling it there, but I give you links to all. Okay, I'll, I'll put some links in the show notes so people can get through to it. Yeah, Yeah. so, you know, just go to saratolmy.ca and, and there will be a how to buy little section there as well. Um, so yes, uh, please do. <laughs> and I know you are now, well, you probably own the only copy in the UK at this moment, I expect. I've got it right in front of me now. Yeah. Okay, great. I can't help but think that he would have approved of that story old, uh, you know, I, I don't think he was such a dry old stick reading his letters. Yeah. I, I came round to that opinion myself, you know, I mean, I do think that there is, you know, there is a bit of just kind of knee-jerk old-fashioned misogyny in there which you cannot get around or explain away entirely but i mean what a surprise <laughs> you know he was a turn of yeah he, how could he be other than that being who he was he couldn't be anybody else yeah right? turn turn of the century academic in a yeah a completely all-male context um and what he evinces about uh, you know femininity is mostly fear. I'm sure he didn't. He didn't have much to do with it, did he? I mean, because he was gay. Yeah, from from the letters, he was. He he had these. You know, uh, I can't remember the name of the guy, but he was clearly very enamoured about about this young man. You know, and so he. I don't know what his experience of women was. Yes, I I don't either. I mean, I, I expect it was fairly limited, and I think that he was a closeted homosexual, um, the way you know people were then. And that was his orientation. So yes, I think that there are just there there are a few little snide moments, you know, that he has. But I mean, for example, in the middle of that story with, with that that kind of weird little comedy that unfolds in the in the the Cambridge University Library reading room, um, you know, that actually did happen to me exactly like that. Yeah, it was just. I mean, I'm so glad I finally got that thing into a story. <laughs> but. Uh, but, you know, I do feel that, you know, the, the remark that he makes about it afterward, you know, that this uh, this was inappropriate you know, behavior is actually apt to him when you think of the way that, well, again, like in the Tractate Middaw, so much of that plot revolves around the problem that women were not admitted to the university library. Yeah. So I think, you know, he was obviously a complex person who had, you know, both sort of radical and conservative impulses going through him at the same time probably like many of us to be honest but there yeah. we are yeah okay well that has been really really interesting to talk to you very interesting story Sarah, i'm going to put those links in the show notes please do well thank you so much for this and i was so delighted that it all kind of came full circle this way that it was from the readings of your readings of mr james that you know so much of that actual story grew and now here it is great so lovely to talk to you there we are. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you.